We're delighted to have uh, Janet Curry here from Princeton. Uh, Janet is the Putnam Professor of Economics at Princeton, uh, and she, she co-directs there the Center for Health and Well-Being. Uh, we're especially happy that Janet accepted our invitation because she just finished uh, being chair of the economics department there and on sabbatical and agreed to come here, I think, before the calendar was totally full. So she's combining visits to other places with her visit to Berkeley, which I was assured was the first on her list. So thank you for agreeing to come during your sabbatical. Uh, Janet got her PhD at, at Princeton Economics and then spent time as a professor at UCLA, MIT, Columbia, before finally returning home to Princeton in 2011. Uh, it's a special pleasure for me to have Janet here because I feel like she's a constant presence in our lives this semester. Last week we had Ron uh, asking questions about her paper, even though someone else was presenting. We uh, <laughs> that last week on inequality and mortality, and in uh, economic demography graduate course, uh, we just added a paper first to our discussion for next week on inequality uh, in life. Uh, and that's a very Eli lecture. We'll read that next week. So today uh, we're going to see a presentation that I understand is not one paper, but an amalgam of many currents of her work on life, death, and mental health, how access to care helps children succeed. So thank you, Janet Craig. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I, I think it's interesting that you're having Anne next week because we sometimes do this kind of tag team right. thing where, you know, she's Deaths of Despair right. and I'm Pollyanna. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you all the good news about how things are getting better and what's working and so on, which is kind of unusual. So, kind of unusual for an economist. So, uh, anyway, so I'm going to hopefully leave you feeling a little bit more optimistic yes. than when you came in. <laughs> so the things that I want to talk about today are sort of in three groups. Um, the first thing is talking about how inequality and mortality in the U.S. declined among children. And I know you've seen some of that work already. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about that work in a comparative perspective, and in particular comparing the U.S. and Canada. And what you'll see is that mortality among children declined to the much lower levels in Canada. And you see that going on for children, but not for other groups. Okay? So I'm going to argue that one of the things that's responsible for that is this tremendous expansion in public health insurance for low-income women and children um, that happened you know, essentially a long time ago now. So this was the late 80s and during the 90s there was this big expansion. So I'm not talking about the ACA. This has nothing to do with the ACA. This is something that we did earlier and we're now seeing, I think, the effects. Uh, and then the third thing I'm going to talk about, which I will say right now is very speculative, is that I think improvements in mental health may be a really important driver for some of the long-term effects of health insurance that we're seeing. And so um, I'm not going to give you causal evidence for that. I'm going to give you some sort of circumstantial evidence that um, might support that interpretation. And I think that's a really hot thing to, to work on and is an area that I'm trying to, to work on um, myself. And just as a preview, is that mental health of the adults, or the, the, the pregnant women, or is that of the so kids? So what I'm going to argue is that the kids who were covered when they were in utero and very young have better mental health as young adults, right. and that there's some evidence of, of that. Okay, so as we know, there's a lot of research uh, highlighting sort of stalling life expectancy and increases in inequality in mortality and some people here have been very active in that literature. Most of that literature focuses on adults, often adults over 45 or over 55 if you kind of use the HRS. A lot of it focuses on non-Hispanic whites because that's where the bad news really seems to be concentrated. Um, I do think that focus only on non-Hispanic whites is a little bit um, misplaced in the sense that it's missing a lot of the other things that are going on. And this 
uh, slide here is just an example of, you, you could pick many examples that were sort of along this line, the, the doom and gloom line. Um, you know, disparity in lifespans of the rich and poor is growing. The reason I picked this one is because I, it particularly irritated me. <laughs> and the reason for that is because they're talking about a bunch of studies of adults over 45, but then the picture <laughs> is a child, right? So they're, they're implying that this is something that's happening to current children. And then they also add this completely gratuitous remark uh, about how uh, expanding access to health care you know, might not even shrink the gap in life expectancy. Right? So none of the studies that they're talking about really address that point at all. But they're trying to say that the increase in inequality is so pervasive that it's driving this increase in health inequality and there's basically nothing you can do about it. That's kind of the story that's being sold, which I think is completely wrong-headed. So, uh, so in some uh, earlier work with Hannes Schwann, uh, we developed a method to try and look at deaths for children. Um, and one of the issues is that if you're trying to look at uh, inequalities in deaths by income or by education, you know, kids don't have an income. They haven't completed their education. Um, so, you know, that's not going to work. So, by focusing on geographical areas, uh, the big advantage from our point of view is that you can look at all deaths at all ages. Because every death is associated with a place. That's the one thing we know about every death is where it took place. Um, so what we do, focusing on places, is to rank uh, places in, our, uh, in the U.S. that would be counties, from richest to poorest, um, and then, uh, you know, as I say, the, the big virtue of that is that we've got everybody and we're not getting some kind of selected sample, which could be selected differently at different times. So if you rank all the U.S. counties from richest to poorest, you still have the problem that there's migration between counties, and in particular, that declining counties, people tend to leave. Okay? So some of the things that you read in the newspaper about how in really poor places, life expectancy is falling, some of that is a migration effect, because if the healthy people leave and the sick people are left, then you're going to get increases in mortality in those places. Right? So uh, what we try and do to get around that problem is to bin counties into bins that each account for about 5% of the population. We've also done it with 1% bins, which is a bit messier because counties don't all fit in 1% bins. But anyways, we're trying to look at a fixed uh, slice of the population, and then you could always go through time and say, well, how does the bottom 5% of the population and the top 5% of the population compare? Yeah? And, and is it possible to focus just on place of birth? Um, no, it's not. Uh, so, yeah, so, so the reason... Yeah, no, it is unfortunate, and, and so it's hard to look directly at the migration question, and what you've got is a bunch of, of cross-sectional slices, right? So, um, but, but at least we think that by looking at these groups, we, we've always got around the same number of, of people going over time, and we're not facing this really shrinking um, uh, populations as you would if you're looking at counties. Okay, so uh, just as an example of what you get out of looking at the data this way, here's a, a plot of infant mortality. So that's you know deaths after deaths in the first year of life, and along this axis you have the poverty percentile. So these are the richest counties, right? And each little marker here is is five percent of the population. So these are the 5% of the population that live in the richest counties, and this is the 5% of the population that lives in the poorest counties. Okay, so the lines slope up, which is 
sort of the well-known fact that infant mortality is higher in poor places than it is in rich places. Okay? Now, looking over time, it's very striking that you have this very large decline between 1990 and 2000, right? which actually corresponds pretty closely to the time period of the rollout of the Medicaid expansions for pregnant women and children. And then you have you know, a smaller but, but still visible decrease in infant mortality between 2000 and 2010. Okay. Now, uh, to judge whether there's an increase or a decrease in... So, one of the things about the inequality and mortality issue is it's hard for people to keep track of the question of, well, you know, mortality is still falling, right? But inequality and mortality could be increasing or decreasing, right? I think it's important not to lose track of the big decline in mortality, whatever was happening to inequality and mortality. But you can also see from this picture what's happening with the inequality and mortality um, by looking at, well, how much did inequality fall in the poorest places compared to in the richest places? Because right? if it falls more in the uh, poorest places than in the richest places, then this line gets flatter, and that indicates that you have less inequality in mortality. Okay? So that's what you see in the infant mortality picture. Is, is there a reason that, I mean, you plot it in the regular scale, we could think of a logarithmic scale, it looks like mortality doubles, in both cases, is there a reason the absolute difference is what we should think of? Yeah, we actually um, talk about this a little bit because it's that's actually not a data question, that's kind of a philosophical yeah, yeah, question, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is, you know, should we care about every death or should we only care about, um, you know, percentage reductions mm -hmm. in death? Okay, so we we put that out there, and you know, we have an appendix that has the differences in logs as well, and we say we, we like the levels yeah. because we think you should count every death when you're talking about child deaths. Mm -hmm. So, and other people might disagree, so you know, you can look at the appendix and see that you still get reductions in inequality and mortality. Okay, so. So basically, we can do this kind of exercise for different age groups and for different demographic groups. Um, so this plot is showing exactly the same thing for zero to four-year-olds for um, white and black males and females. Okay? And uh, there's one wrinkle here, which is that instead of one line for 2010, we have two lines for 2010. It's a bit of a distraction in terms of the main message of the talk, but I just think it's really neat that it matters so much for little kids whether you include mixed race people hmm. in the denominator or not. Right? Wow. So a lot of people here will remember when the census first started giving people the option to choose more than one race. Right? And people thought, oh, this is going to be a really big deal. There's going to be lots of people checking these boxes. And then on aggregate, there really aren't a lot of people checking multiple boxes, except it turns out that for kids, there, there really are. There's enough of them that it matters when you're computing death rates. Because for deaths, you, you actually only have one race. So you have a certain number of deaths. Mm -hmm. And then when you're computing the rate, the, what you put in the denominator matters, right? So if you put in all the multiple race people, you get a bigger denominator and a lower rate. Okay? So you can see that actually really makes a difference for African Americans, not so much for whites. Okay, so that's why there's two lines for that. Uh, and you can see here that you're still seeing the reduction in mortality in all of these groups. I think you know, if I wasn't here telling you what you should see in this picture, you one of the things that would really jump out is how big the declines are for um, black kids, right? Much bigger than the declines for white kids. And so that is a piece of this sort of generally good news story that really has been completely lost in, in the discussion. Right? I don't think almost anybody walking around would know that there'd been this huge decline in mortality for, for black kids over this time period. Uh, and you can also see the uh, decrease in inequality and mortality um, 
uh, especially among white kids. Sorry. How do you explain the difference between boys and girls with an age race? Or the, is it all driven by what's happening during the first year of life, or do you still see uh, gender differences in mortality between one and four? Oh, you still see this. So, um, We've done this for much finer age categories, so I'm just showing this for the purposes of, of not showing you eight million pictures. Um, but you would still see that for older children, so it's not only for infants that this is happening. And the uh, differences for males and females are actually quite different for different ages. Um, so, for example, if you look at kids 5 to 19, then you're really seeing a lot for males. This is white males and African American males relative to females where you're seeing much smaller um, declines. And um, uh, so I have a theory about this. I'll just tell you my theory. I don't have any evidence that this theory is correct <laughs> at this stage, so uh, that's a warning. But if you look at what people die of at this age, it's mostly injuries. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to have a big decline in um, deaths due to injuries probably reflects better access to uh, immediate medical care. Um, and so one of the things that I think happened as a result of the Medicaid expansions that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is that um, access to medical care for children improved because now every child is a paying customer. Right? So if you look at things like whether a hospital has a trauma unit or not, you have increases in the number of hospitals with trauma units, you have increases in the number of hospitals with neonatal intensive care units, because you're taking a whole group of people and making them into um, paying customers. Right? And that affects the decisions that are made about <coughs> medical care at the margin. And actually, I think has spillover effects to other groups. That seems a little counterintuitive, though, because if, if you're a parent and your child has an accident, I just feel like you adults might forfeit more, forsake care of their own, but they take their child regardless to the hospital if it's a major accident. That's kind of mortality. Yeah. I'm risk. not talking about the parents. I'm talking about the hospital. How the hospital behaves. Like, does your hospital even have a trauma unit? I see. Right? I see. It's, it's um, the, it's does the your provision. hospital turn you away? Mm. Right? So here in California, at least the last time I looked, there was a limit on damages. So, you know, the hospital is legally required to accept anybody who comes in an unstable condition. I understand. Supply but side they can still send the ambulance somewhere else, and then they have like a $100,000 fine or something. If this is a, a case that's going to cost more than $100,000, some of those ambulances are going to be diverted. Right? It's, not, it's not the accident risk. We I mean, are cars getting safer even over this 10 year period. I mean, just think of maybe yeah, gunshot risk. But, is not so, there. why wouldn't girl, little girls benefit from that also? Are there differences in drivership at teenagers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not being driven only by teenagers, though. I, I nope. anyway, oh, okay. but there was also a big decline in homicides during between the 1990s. Yeah, and some of it is some of it is violence. Yeah. That's true. But again, um, you know that's also very sensitive to medical care, right? Yeah. So right now we have a lot of people who've been saved from being shot because we have good trauma care for that specific uh, problem. Anyway, I think this would be an interesting thing to 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 look further into, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, you know, trying to think of a good way to do that. Okay, um, then if you look at adults, uh, again, you're seeing, especially for black males, a big decline in deaths at 20 to 49, so I think this really is reflecting a lot the decline in violence. Um, and then what you see here for women, uh, 20 to 49, is, is something really different than in any of the other pictures. Because here, the blue line is below the other lines, which is indicating that uh, mortality rates are actually increasing. Okay? So that's kind of the things that everybody has been talking about. And you'll hear a lot more from, from Anne Case next week about this. Um, so you do see that in this way of looking at the data also. Okay? And then for white males, 
You also see really not much of an improvement in mortality for uh, the top end of the distribution and a little bit for the bottom end of the distribution. And then for both African American females and males, you're still seeing uh, declines in mortality for adults. And then for 50 plus, um, you see declines in mortality, but you see much more sharply now the lines are converging, mm -hmm. which is indicating increases in inequality. Okay? So by, by going through all the age groups, I can show you that I, I am getting results that are consistent with what other people have done. <coughs> it's just that other people have really been focusing on older people, which is not, um, you know, it, it's sensible if you're looking at you know, total mortality because most of the deaths are among older people, but it doesn't necessarily give you a good picture of what's going on for the younger uh, groups. Okay, so that's just to go through these different um, trends in mortality for, for children than for adults. And I think um, one thing that this shows is that increases in economic inequality don't necessarily lead to increases in inequality and mortality. Right? Because I've shown you a counterexample. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, you might ask, well, why not? What changed? And so one uh, thing that changed is declining poverty. We also have a lot higher spending on social programs for children over this period, uh, and especially Medicaid um, with this larger share covered by health insurance prenatally and also in childhood. So. If you look at uh, poverty rates, um, this is this dashed line here is the official poverty rate that the census puts out. And one kind of well-known issue with the official poverty measure, sort of deeply perverse, because um, it's set up so that none of our anti-poverty programs can have any impact on the official poverty measure by definition, because the official poverty measure doesn't include in-kind transfers like food stamps, public housing, uh, or Medicaid. And it also doesn't include uh, ta taxes and transfers like the earned income tax credit. Mm -hmm. So since we give most of our support to poor families either in-kind or through the tax system, through the earned income tax credit, none of those things could possibly have any impact on the official poverty rate. Okay? So the census is well aware of this and puts out another measure called the Supplemental Poverty Measure, which does include at least some of the in-kind transfers, although it still doesn't include Medicaid, and it includes the earned effect of the earned income tax credit. So if you use that measure, which does uh, allow for the impact of anti-poverty programs, you see you know, a big decline, uh, almost a, a decline by half over this period. Okay? And so you know, that might be expected to have some effect on child health. Yeah. So here it's the proportion of children in poverty, right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So how, uh, because there, there have also been shift in fertility. Uh, there is, for instance, less adolescent fertility, and uh, fertility has declined also for the lower income population. So how much of this is due to changing the structure of fertility and how much is due to actual economic change? Okay, so so I'm not going to talk very much about fertility and, and obviously there are going to be some fertility trends that might influence this. I don't think that's going to have any um, <coughs> impact on the difference between these two lines, mm -hmm. which is really reflective of how poverty is measured, mm -hmm. you know, and whether uh, one type of program is included or not. Okay, so my main point here is just that if if you measure poverty in a more sensible <coughs> way, with, with including the resources that we give people is arguably a better measure of what resources are available to the household. If you do that, then you do see that there's been a decline in child poverty. Um, and then, you know, how much do we spend? Well, if you look at these different programs, one of the really big ones is the earned in income tax credit. So this is the biggest cash program now. Yes? On the last slide, there's a notable lump in the middle. Uh, in other words, I'm wondering if that's 
uh, employment. <coughs> Your SPM uh, line has a huge lump. Right. So, so there is, um, you know, there are economic fluctuations. It's maybe easier to think about the, comparing this lump here to this flat part, right? So we know that a lot of people, by the official poverty measure, went into poverty during the recession, but then the supplemental poverty measure is pretty flat. So you could look at that and surmise that, oh, actually, our safety net programs did a fairly decent job preventing people from falling further into poverty, even when their cash incomes were really falling during the Great Recession in 2008. Okay. So as I told you, I'm Pollyanna, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so SNAP, the this, what used to be called food stamps, has also had a large increase. And then, you know, but the real gorilla of um, social programs here is Medicaid. You can see how much bigger it is than the other programs. So what was going on with Medicaid? I'm just going to sort of recap what this Medicaid expansion was um, and you know, hopefully give you some idea about why I think it was so important. Okay. So what this plot is showing is the fraction of 18 to 44 year old women who would be eligible for Medicaid coverage of pregnancy um, and this is you know, this is computed using data from the current population surveys, right? So not every woman is pregnant, but if she became pregnant, would she be eligible for Medicaid coverage? And that number goes up from about 12% of all women in 1980 to 43% by 1992. So that's a very huge expansion. And if you look today at how many births are covered by the Medicaid program, it's about 45%. Okay, so this is a really big program covering pregnant women. The scatter on here is reflecting uh, variation across states. Right? So the central tendency is up, but there's still a lot of variation across states and how many people that they're covering, which is useful for us as researchers. What, what does it mean to be eligible? If, you're, if, you're too, if your earnings are too high, you're not eligible? If or if the program yeah, is too income, limited? There's an income cutoff, which is different in, in every state. Um, but basically the only really operative criteria now is an income cutoff. Mm -hmm. There used to be all sorts of other criteria. But it's not that women, that women got poorer, it's that the cutoff was raised. The cutoff, time. so yeah, that's a good point. So it used to be that you had to be on AFDC. Mm -hmm. You know, in some states the income cutoff for AFDC might be as low as, you know, 25% of the federal poverty line. Mm -hmm. And then in a lot of states, the Medicaid cutoff is now higher than 200% of the poverty line, right? So it's a very huge expansion, right? And, um, you know, this isn't an accident or anything. This is totally intentional. Congress did this. All these bills were passed bipartisanly because people thought it was important to give health insurance to pregnant women. Okay, same thing for children. So this expansion, is a little bit later, and it's going up into the 2000s. And this was phased in uh, by age. So first the youngest <coughs> children were covered, and then eventually the oldest children were covered. And so you can see that you're going from rates of you know 15 to 20 percent of kids with Medicaid coverage to I shouldn't say coverage with eligibility for mm -hmm. Medicaid coverage to 40 to 50 percent of kids with eligibility for Medicaid. <coughs> Right? So we have large numbers of kids that have private health insurance through their parents, and then we have 40 to 50 percent of kids who have eligibility for Medicaid coverage. And M Medicaid, uh, unlike a lot of other social programs, uh, people often get it by going to the hospital with something wrong with them. So mm -hmm. if I walk in and I look like I'm eligible, the hospital is going to apply to Medicaid to get reimbursed for any care that they give me. Okay, so this is what I mean by saying that now basically all children are paying customers. Right? So I don't have to worry if I'm a physician that I'm going to have this huge uncompensated care bill by serving pregnant women or by serving children. And so are, is it explicitly part of Medicaid rules that you not have private coverage or that you not be offered private coverage? Or do some of these folks, is there some overlap? 
at the end of the time series where people might Medicaid eligible but also be covered by a parent with a plan? Um, th that's a good question. I'm sure that varies across states. I don't think it's enforceable. Um, so there's a whole other literature about crowd out and whether people were declining private health insurance coverage in order to go on Medicaid. Um, and there's some, so the answer to that question is yes, but then how much? There's a lot of debate about exactly how much that is. Okay, for my purposes, the important point is that you know, most kids are going to have health insurance at the end of this process. Okay. So, um, so I think that this is a good candidate for explaining what was going on up for, in child health. Uh, and so what I'm going to try and show is, um, by way of comparison with Canada, I, I, I'm going to try and offer some support for that argument. So in Canada, a, a lot of things like the kind of cars that people drive and so on are very similar to what's done in the United States. The kind of medical care that's available is very similar to what's in, available in the United States. And also, poverty rates showed similar declines if you measured in a similar way in Canada and the U.S. On the other hand, there's a really big difference, which is that Canadian children had universal health insurance coverage through this whole period, as did everybody else in Canada. So if you compare the trends in mortality and uh, mortality inequality across the two countries, that might shed some light on what's going on. Okay, so before I do that, I just want to show my, uh, my hockey stick of mortality here. <laughs> um, since you're all demographers, you all know this already, but you have very high mortality for the infants, which falls and then increases, um, especially in late adolescence, and then increases more gradually through the life course. Um, what I wanted to emphasize here was that the blue lines, which are for the U.S., lie everywhere above the green lines, which are for Canada. Right? So for every single age, the mortality rates are higher in the U.S. than they are for Canada. They also tend to be higher for males than for females at all ages. Right? And that we see almost everywhere. Okay, now, if you do the same sort of exercise that I was doing before, um, now I'm trying to overlay Canada and the U.S. So here for the zero to four year olds, the blue lines are the ones that we were looking at for the U.S. already, and the red lines are for Canada. Um, and so you can see the Canadian lines were flatter to start off in 1990. In the richest places, mortality among children was pretty similar in the U.S. and Canada, mm -hmm. but in poor places, mortality was way higher among uh, children in the U.S. than in Canada. So what happens over this 20-year uh, period is you have this big decline in mortality. Uh, and basically the line, you know, there's still a gap here at the end of the period, but it's a pretty small gap. Right? So the gap in the, uh, between Canada and the U.S. gets much smaller for the youngest children. Are the <coughs> Canadian percentiles comparable? Or are they just, is there just less inequality in Canada? Yeah, I haven't told you very much about how the sausage is being made here. <laughs> um, so there is uh, there's a lot of issues with areas. So we ended up using um, um, what's it called now? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. But um, uh, basically, a census definition the that's a little bit or like the CZ a, community zone. Those are all things you use in the U.S. Canada has a completely ah, different set of concepts. I see. So trying to find the equivalent <coughs> concept to a county, I'm, I'm just blanking on the name of it. Uh, but then there's also an issue in Canada, with, which is that they compute poverty rates in a different way. Right? And they um, have higher thresholds in cities. So they have some really bizarre things, like, for example, Toronto is very high poverty according to the Statistics Canada measure, but has very low death rates. Right? So alone among countries in the world you get the wrong correlation in Canada between poverty and, and death rates. So we uh, constructed a poverty rate for Canada which is more similar to the US poverty rate which uses a fixed cutoff across areas. 
and then um, re-ranked the uh, geographic areas. Mm. Okay, but um, basically, given our geographic areas, we've done exactly the same thing of putting them in five percent of the population bins. Okay, so one one thing about our method, which you know may not be super elegant, but you can apply it in lots of different settings in order to do this kind of comparison. Um, okay, so you see this convergence for children, and then you don't see that for the middle aged. You still see a pretty large gap between Canada and the U.S. And then you know for older groups, you see an even bigger gap. Okay, so that's for um, males. And then for females, I think you see something really striking. So consistent with the um, issue that mortality actually may be rising for middle-aged women, you see in the U.S. like no progress at all in, hmm. in terms of changing this gradient. In Canada, you do still get a decline in mortality, and you have a very large gap between Canada and the U.S. in terms of mortality for middle-aged women. Hmm. Okay. So... Quick question. So why didn't you use the uh, between state variation uh, in Medicaid coverages? Between state, state variation... In Medicaid coverage. To... Oh, I will show you some okay. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I can't really do that for the Canada-U.S. comparison, but I will show you that in a minute, if, if I still have any minutes left. Um, okay, so just to summarize then, what I think you get out of this comparison is you see that mortality for the young and the old fell in both countries, um, ex except for middle-aged women where mortality seems to have stalled. Um, the U.S. child mortality converged <coughs> to what was a much lower Canadian rate, which I think is really striking. And you don't really see that kind of convergence for the other groups. So since you had this Medicaid expansion, which was the largest social policy that was affecting only children, and it just supports the idea that that was an important factor. Okay, so coming back to the Medicaid expansion, you know, what evidence do we have that it actually did anything in terms of health? Um, one of the things that people have tried to take advantage of is the fact that different states have really different programs to begin with. So when they were all brought up to a more generous level, that uh, resulted in much larger changes in some places than in others. Um, so this map, which was done by um, Sarah Miller and Laura Weary, is showing the change in the fraction of 18 to 44 year old women who would be eligible for Medicaid in the event of pregnancy. So you can see like stingy places like Texas and Florida have really big increases. Uh, other places uh, like Vermont, which is always generous, have a less big increase. So people have used that kind of variation to try and look at the effect. I did some of the early work on this, and we found that there was a 8.5% reduction in infant mortality uh, with these expansions. And you could connect that to changes in care that people were receiving. So for example, there was a 50% reduction in delay in obtaining prenatal care among the mothers who were in the highest poverty group who would have been the most impacted by these Medicaid expansions. Okay, now, a lot of time has gone by since 1990. Mm -hmm. So you can actually look at the long-term effect of this. And so this, this paper by Miller and Wary does that. And um, they find some really striking results. So these young adult children of mothers who became eligible as a result of the Medicaid expansions are a third of a standard deviation less likely to have a chronic condition. They have fewer hospital visits. Uh, and they're more likely to have graduated from high school. So that's overall. And then if they look more closely at the poorest people, they find two-thirds of a standard deviation uh, reduction in the probability of having a chronic condition, an even bigger reduction in hospital visits, um, that they're more likely to graduate from high school, and then some other results which are not there in the full sample, like increases in the probability of some college attendance, increases in personal income, 
decreases in the probability of using food stamps, and also a decline on the Kessler mental distress score, which I'll come back to. So uh, that was talking about coverage of pregnant women. There's also this big expansion to children. So a lot of the research um, looking at the expansion for children takes advantage of a quirk in the law which said that you were eligible if you were born after September 1, 1983. Okay, so if you were born on August 30th, 1983, forget it, you weren't eligible for any of these expansions. Um, and so you know, a lot of different people have looked at some version of, of that and found uh, positive effects in a wide variety of data sets. So, this figure is like the previous one in that it's showing how many years of Medicaid eligibility you had if you were born in 1981 compared to if you were born in 1984. And the darker shade indicates that you were eligible for more years. Okay. And so, uh, for example, Laura Weary has a paper looking at hospitalizations and uh, using this discontinuity. So these are people born in the 50 months prior to the date, so they're never eligible. And these are people born in the 50 months after the date, so they're eligible. And you can <coughs> see the drop in probability of hospitalizations in this group of young adults. So that's just an example. They have lots of other um, groups that they look at. Uh, this is from a different paper by Brown, Kowalski, and Lurie where they're using the income tax data. There's lots of interesting outcomes that you can look at in the income tax data. And here they're saying, um, looking at different groups by family poverty and looking at the taxes that these people paid when they were 19 to 28 years old. Okay, and this is in dollars here. So in this uh, group that was the poorest when they were 15 to 18, they see a $1,700 increase in the amount of taxes paid at age 28 um, with an additional year of Medicaid eligibility. Okay. So it's a pretty big effect. And then the other thing, depending how you look at it, you, know, you might think, oh, well, why is there any effect for richer people? Um, and so I guess some people might think, well, that you know, disproves the whole research design or something. I actually think what this is evidence of is uh, the spillovers that I was talking about, where you know, if you build a trauma unit or you build a NICU, that benefits everybody, not only the low-income people. OK, so now I'm going to uh, turn. Maybe it's good that I don't have that much time left, but I, I'm going to turn to the more speculative part of my talk and uh, argue why I think mental health might be a mechanism for these improvements in outcomes that we see. So the outcomes are including things like wages, whether people work, whether they go to college, and so on. Right? So first of all, mental health is one of the most important determinants of adult outcomes. Um, and People haven't really looked at that very much, but they're starting to, and that I think the evidence is pretty startling. A lot of mental health problems seem to have their origin in childhood or even in the prenatal period, even though they may first manifest in early adulthood or in adolescence. And there's increasing evidence that maternal mental health has an important impact on the child. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about some of this evidence. Um, just in terms of how common these problems are, this is a map showing the annual <coughs> antidepressant prescriptions per person by county. Okay, so the dark squares here are places that have more than two wow. antidepressant prescriptions per person in the county in 2014. Okay. So, yeah, so this is like a really common outcome. Uh, there's about 12% of U.S. adults over 12 years old are taking an antidepressant prescription. Okay. Also, there's a lot of controversy about increases in medication for ADHD among children. This slide is showing data from the MAPS, 
the dark blue line is the increase or is the total uh, ADHD prescriptions. Okay? And the reason I'm breaking out, out here into the Medicaid people and the privately insured is because it seems like most of this increase in ADHD prescriptions is actually going on in the Medicaid population and not in mm. the privately insured population. Okay, so it does seem mm. to have something to do with Medicaid. I'll come back to that. But there's about 4 to 6 percent of U.S. children who are diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, and then if you just <coughs> ask people about their mental health, this is from the general social survey where they've asked the same question since 2002, which is now thinking about your mental health, which includes stress, depression, and problems with emotions, for how many days during the past 30 days was your mental health not good? Okay. Uh, and so uh, what I thought was surprising is how many people are reporting that they have, say, 10 plus days in the past 30 where their mental health was not good. Um, that's about, you know, 15 percent, uh, fairly constant <coughs> over time. Okay, so a lot of people are reporting that this is a problem for them. If you look at health data, something like ER admissions, this is uh, data from the Healthcare Utilization Project for five states where I have the universe of ER visits and I'm just looking at was there a code for mental health problem on your uh, record. Okay, so overall there's about 380 ER visits per thousand every year. If you look at how many of those have a mental health issue, it's about 13%. And then you can look further and say, well, what mental health issue is it? Uh, substance abuse is important, but that's about 3% have substance use only. Uh, mood disorders like depression are pretty big, but so about 5% of ER, admission, ER visits have something to do with depression. Another 5% have to do with anxiety. So you have a lot of people showing up in the ER because they're having a panic attack, for example. Sorry, yeah, so that's, that's when mental health is, is named as the only reason for people are in ER. So like if people have psychosomatic, like somatic manifestations of mental health. Like no, this is if it appears anywhere on the mm. record. So the thing is you have like up to 25 different diagnoses, right? And very often you get many diagnoses. And they, they can compensate for each one. Uh, yeah, they get compensated for things like diabetes, like complications of diabetes. I'm not sure that they get compensated a lot more for having these mental health codes, but they they are actually, I'm just trying to make yeah. the point that there's a lot of, of people showing up with these problems. Okay, and then if you look at um, them directly in terms of how they affect people's work lives, this is a little bit old data, but it's from the BLS. And what they're asking is, if you missed work because of a health condition, how much work did you miss? And here the red bar is some kind of mental health problem, and the blue bar is a physical health problem. Right? So if I have a physical health problem, I'm much more likely to be in the, like, I missed work for one day category or two days. And if I'm in the mental health category, I'm much more likely to have missed work for more than 30 days. And so this can be very debilitating to people as well as being really common. But the denominator here is people who miss work? This is everybody who missed work, yeah, if days lost greater than zero. Okay, so, the, the great, so people may, more people may miss work from, from physical than mental health, but if you miss from mental yeah. health, then you miss more. I mean, I wish they had updated this okay. survey, but right, as far as I could see, they haven't done it for a while. <laughs> We have about five more minutes, so let's hold our questions till Janet's done. Let her get a chance to finish. Yeah, I'm not going to force questions. Just to end where you want to end this. But yeah. I do want to talk a little bit more about this. So um, the second, so the first bullet about mental health was just that it's pretty pervasive. It has really big effects. We probably don't think about it or study it as much as we should. Okay, the second bullet is that mental health problems often begin in childhood, continue in adulthood and have major impacts. So I have done some work looking at this using administrative data from Canada, where I can see like every time anybody did anything medically, because 
it's all there. Uh, and then you can link that to um, some outcomes. And so what I do is try and compare common physical conditions, uh, especially asthma and injuries, to common mental health conditions among children, uh, specifically ADHD and, and conduct disorders. And the outcomes that I can link to are uh, welfare use after age 18, being on time in school, and whether you're taking the courses that you need in high school to be able to qualify for uh, college. So just like for the UCs, you have to take certain courses to be able to come here. Uh, it's the same in Canada. Okay, and what I'm doing here is just plotting the estimated coefficients so you can compare visually the difference between uh, having different conditions at different ages and the effect on the outcome. So this is whether you went on welfare at age 18, when that's when people qualify to go on to welfare in Canada. So you can see that ADHD or conduct disorder seems to have a much larger um, predictive impact on that than either asthma or injuries. Um, similarly, if you look at taking college prep math courses, um, ADHD and conduct disorder has a much bigger So the effect. age here is where you're diagnosed or where you That's should. the age where I see that you've got some kind of a treatment. Got it. Right? So some people only appear in the record once. And then there's probably people in this room whose kid, who were told that their kid might have ADHD at some point and maybe did something and then you know, never did anything else. So that gets captured sometimes. Uh, and so then this is trying to look at the effect of a persistent um, uh, treatment for ADHD and that has a bigger effect than being diagnosed at any other point in time periods. Okay. We also know uh, from other literature that prenatal conditions can place children at risk of poor mental health. So there's the evidence linking things like the Dutch hunger winter to schizophrenia. But there's also work looking at administrative data and looking at sort of milder health differences, like differences in birth weight between identical twins and finding a strong association with ADHD. Okay, so, um, let's see. another paper I just wanted to mention is the one by <coughs> Petra Pearson and Maya Rosen Slater, where they're looking at, so the research design here is that everybody that they're considering lost a close family member, but some of them it happened while the mother was pregnant, and some of them it happened after the mother was pregnant. So if it happened while the mother was pregnant, there's a 25% increase in the probability that the child who was in utero is uh, prescribed ADHD drugs later on. And then when they become adult, they're more likely to be taking medications for depression and anxiety. Okay. Um, so finally, uh, I guess this is getting depressing, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say that I think that there's some evidence that some of these programs have helped. Okay, so I mentioned the Mill and Wary finding about improvements in the Kessler scores of children who are affected by the Medicaid expansions prenatally. So that's kind of remarkable that you can see a quite large effect in the young adults. Um, I've also done some work with Anna Cherney, who's a postdoc at Princeton, looking at the impact of prenatal WIC participation on mental health of children who are 6 to 11 years old in South Carolina. Um, I'll just say we find reductions in ADHD and other mental health conditions that are diagnosed in childhood. Uh, I also just want to mention that I, I think this is very counterintuitive for people because we do hear a lot more about <coughs> mental health conditions for children and it, it may be that there are increases in mental health conditions but I think there's for sure a lot of change in diagnosis and there's a lot of change in screening. So, and, you know, when I first started thinking about this 20 years ago there was a debate about whether it was even possible for a child to be depressed. Some people said that wow. was not possible. Only adolescents. You could only be depressed once you hit puberty. Uh, and now that just sounds like nonsense, right? So views have really changed. Um, and 
Also, the incentives facing providers may be resulting in more screening. So as I showed you with the ADHD, a lot of that is being driven by Medicaid. Medicaid has converted from fee-for-service to managed care in almost every state. And managed care, they get paid uh, on a risk-adjusted basis. So if the child has a chronic condition, they get paid more. Right? So they have a real incentive to screen and find chronic conditions. Okay? And so that has um, an impact on ADHD. Okay? So this is looking at a change in South Carolina where they changed from fee-for-service to managed care. There's an uh, increase in wild child screenings, <coughs> and then the increase in the ADHD treatment tracks pretty exactly. So when I show people this, they sort of get upset because they're primed to think that it's bad to give kids drugs for ADHD. A lot of people think that. So you might want to look at other types of screenings and conditions as well. And so what you see is an, in, and so this is a child fixed effect model where I look at the same child before and after their plans switched to mm -hmm. managed care. You see increases in well child screening, increases in developmental screening, increases wow. in vaccination. And these are all kids who were covered by Medicaid the whole time, mm -hmm. right? But then the way that Medicaid is implemented is also having an effect. So you see these increases even for sick visits. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at chronic conditions, you see an increase in ADHD, increase in depression, mm -hmm. but also increases in treatment for asthma. Mm -hmm. so everybody thinks that's good, right? If we're screening for asthma and we're treating, that's good. Uh, also increases in treatment for mild infections, not for medium or severe infections. Those are getting treated anyway. Uh, ear, nose, and throat, no, autoimmune conditions. So those are just some that, that we picked out. So you see a general increase in screening, and then you get more cases. So just to uh, sort of summarize and conclude, uh, I'm arguing that access to health care starting in the prenatal period has a pretty profound effect on child and adult health and productivity that the rollout of public health insurance in the United States has had these big effects, which you can even see in the reduction in inequality and mortality, um, and that this reduction in inequality and mortality occurred against this backdrop of increases in inequality for adults, right? So if anything, we're sort of swimming against the tide with the kids, but still seeing these big effects. Um, I think, and at this point is sort of my opinion, but I think that prevention of mental health problems may be one of the important mechanisms hmm. whereby the increase in health insurance is affecting the adult outcomes like working and uh, earnings. And although mental health diagnoses in children are increasing, this may partly be, be because of the access to care. Right? So kids who didn't have access didn't get screened, so they might have had problems, we didn't know about it, we didn't try and treat them. And uh, I think that administrative data sets are a promising way to try and contribute to the evaluation of whether this is an important pathway uh, in, in future research. So, Um, yeah, terrific, wonderful. <laughs> um, but I wanted to, two things. Well, I wanted to go back to Josh's question early on. You said that, yeah, but we have a table in the appendix or something. But how did, does that show um, convergence by percent in poverty uh, when you look at it in on the log scale other than arithmetic scale? So, um, so I haven't got it in front of me, but my recollection is that the, the story is qualitatively similar. It's just the magnitude surface. I think m most people seeing this are going to think that it's referring to the proportional change, <coughs> change in law. So I, I would... Most demographers, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. And then <laughs> I gather from it, it, it sounds as if you would what you've done suggests that in fact these generations are going to have narrower differences in mortality and health as they move forward. That is, it looks like this is a cohort change that we'd expect to continue into older ages and so that we'd get more convergence, say, in 20, 30 years. Right. I, I, am, I think that's exactly right, and I am cautiously optimistic about that, although there's still opportunity for these cohorts to go off the rails, you know, for other reasons, <laughs> like if they all become addicted to opioids yeah. or something, sure. right? So, um, uh, but yes, the, the health endowment that people are starting with is much better, and I think you're seeing that in a range of outcomes. So I only gave two examples, but other people are looking at things like uh, educational attainment using different data sets and finding positive effects. So um, I think it's actually quite remarkable that this kind of uh, research design of looking for these cohorts in data, uh, which has young adult outcomes, a bunch of different researchers have done it using a bunch of different data sets and all found pretty large impacts. Um, so, so part of my purpose in giving this particular talk is I just feel like people should know about this and they don't, right? So people don't know that they're, they, they know that Medicaid is very expensive because yeah. people talk about that all the time. They don't know that we got anything for our money. So. So uh, this is very persuasive. Could you, you said we we're, we're not going to talk about the ACA, but perhaps you could take a minute to comment about so the most recent studies that seem to be popping up about expansion of Medicaid in the last few years seem to not find any particularly dramatic effects on mortality, and I'm not even sure about health. You want to say anything about that? Yeah. So, um, so one thing that. Uh, Again, I think a lot of people don't really realize about the ACA is that the sort of target group for the ACA is adults, right? Because the kids were already covered. So we're not talking about expanding Medicaid coverage for children because they were largely covered. And in fact, they're covered at higher income levels. So now you have, um, so the ACA said that you had to cover people up to 133% of poverty. In a lot of states, kids are covered up to 185 or 200 percent of poverty. So when somebody turns 18, they might lose their Medicaid coverage. Um, uh, and there was a provision in the ACA to deal with that, which some states have taken up and other states haven't. Um, but anyway, so it's mostly adults. And I do think that I think you know the most famous incidents of this is the Oregon Health Insurance Study where they did a randomized trial. So they had a whole bunch, they, they had more money for Medicaid, they got permission to randomize people into Medicaid coverage. So they had adults who applied and some of them got it and some of them didn't. The ones that got it, uh, they didn't see reductions in use of medical care. They saw increases in use of medical care. More people going to ERs actually, which was a disappointment. Um, they also didn't see a lot in um, biomarkers having to do with blood sugar or high blood pressure, things like that. They did see mental health effects. So people did report being much less likely to be depressed, um, less anxious. Right? So I think with adults, one of the important things to consider is, well, what exactly do you expect to happen? So you have a bunch of people who don't have any health insurance. They're used to, if they get sick, go to the ER. Now they have health insurance. Right? So you would like them to go and find a primary care physician. They might not actually know how to do that right? if they've always gone to the ER. So you get them going to the ER more because now it's paid for. Right? So that, I can understand how that could happen. You also don't immediately get behavior change in terms of uh, better compliance with diabetes regimes, better compliance with you know, taking your high blood pressure meds and all of that. So I think all of those are things that might take time to change in adults. And you know, maybe the sort of difference in difference design is not really going to pick that up very easily. Um, but I, and I do think it's significant that 
people are reporting improvements in their mental health, and that that might actually be reflected in things like labor market outcomes down the road. So no more no. questions. See, we have three more minutes, so let's be brief. So, in the demography group here, we've been pushing training in spatial demography, and you have an essentially spatial criterion in your ordering, and yet you're not telling us a spatial story. You have a largely non-spatial story. Could you? Uh, React to that. <laughs> <laughs> why, not, why, doesn't, why doesn't space come into your story? Why don't places, the character and locations of these places come into your story? Well, this is part of a broader conversation. I, I actually think, and I've tried to sell when I've been asked, that it's more effective to have people-based strategies than place-based strategies. And part of the reason, and I know a lot of people feel very strongly the reverse, but when you have a place-based strategy and you have mobility, often if you improve the place, the only thing that's going to happen is that the disadvantaged people that are there are going to get pushed out. And you see that, for example, with environmental remediation. Um, I've, I've done some work showing that when you clean up a Superfund site, it has positive impacts on property values, and if you just look at the demography of who's living there, white college-educated people move in, black high school dropouts move out. Okay. So targeting is really difficult with respect to, to place-based policies, and I feel like, okay, if I want to compensate somebody for the fact that they're living in a place with a Superfund site, why not send them a check? And then they can use that to pay a down payment on an apartment somewhere else if they want to do that. Uh, so I guess the reason why I'm not emphasizing the place-based thing, I think a lot of the story has been about places <coughs> that are left behind and so on and so forth. And I, I guess I'd much rather think about people who are left behind, who you can find anywhere and you know what can be done for them. For our last question, we have Marianne coming all the way back to Berkeley from Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't recall necessarily the coverage rates for adults over time in terms of health insurance, but do you have any sense of if there are any sort of spillover effects from having healthier parents who are more likely to be covered um, by some form of health insurance on children and that could possibly help explain in any sort of way the inequality gradient falling uh, so there have been some um, studies that show when parents have health insurance, they're likely to both white and for their children. Yeah, that, so that's what I was thinking of. So I guess you probably know that literature as well as I do. Um, that seemed to be the major effect that when, um, and, and I'm not quite sure why exactly that's happening, like what the mechanism is. Maybe they go to a clinic, and if I'm going to the clinic myself, I'll bring the kid at the same time or something like that. Um, I also think for the WIC results, I think that's one of the reasons why WIC is effective is because it's often operated through clinics and it directly hooks people up with medical care and then when they lose that, they may not, even though they maintain their Medicaid coverage, they may not be able to use it as effectively. Okay, so I know we have more questions, but let's uh, end our seminar here. Thank you so much.